So tonight we're going to cover chapter 10, function factories. Um, what we're going to be focusing on is I think these, I think this chapter had four kind of main learning objectives that we should be getting out of it. The first one is just understanding what a function factory is. Uh, then the second one is recognize how function function factories work and then discuss and learn about non obvious combinations of function factories. So some application and then really observe how to generate a family of functions from data and a function factory. So how can we use some of those functional concepts that we discussed last time to develop additional functions uh, using like a list or like a data frame and so on and so forth. So to kind of get started here, um, we have to really first define what is a function factory. And really at its core, a function factory is pretty simple. A uh, function factory is a function that makes functions. Um, <laughs> If you read into this chapter, it gets a little bit more complex than just that simple definition, but really that's like the foundation of it. We are crafting functions using a function. And part of this, and the book says that this isn't really a technical term, but it's a term to kind of help keep things uh, a little bit more organized. A factory made function is known as a manufactured function. And so a lot of the examples that we're gonna work with, especially observing some of the behavior of, fa of function factories, is looking at the manufactured functions that get produced from a function factory. So before we do this, the book really kind of emphasizes some like review of key concepts because now I think we're kind of at the point in the book where we're starting to take some of those foundational chapters that we've been talking about and kind of piecemealing some concepts together to really understand how to create function factories. And so some of those that I kind of felt that needed to be highlighted again were this idea of R's first class function behavior or characteristic. So functions are like any other object in R. And so I think that's something that needs to be reemphasized. Um, we basically, there's nothing special that we need to do to define a function. We just use the assignment operator to create a binding. And then functions behave just like any other object. And since they behave just like any other object, they can have similar characteristics to any object that we can create in R. And then the kind of the big thing that gets discussed in here is the use of environments. And so functions enclose the environment in which it is created. And so this part of the chapter, I really kind of struggled with, and I kind of want to get some clarification and maybe talk through it a little bit more but this, this idea of like enclosed environments versus like parent environments and how that interacts with function factories. Like I got a little confused with that. And so maybe we can kind of clarify that a little bit more, especially within this. And then the other thing that we need to remember is, is that functions create their own execution environments. And so this is really important because one of the key kind of concepts that we'll talk about with function factories is that execution environments become the enclosing environment of a manufactured function. And so um, there's some diagrams that I'm gonna share from the chapter that I think kind of really kind of emphasize this, but um, this is the key point, is that basically the execution environments become the enclosing environment of a manufactured function. So to kind of get started, we need a couple of tools to work with and to kind of use the examples. And so the libraries that we'll be working with is rlang, uh, mainly to be looking at environments and to access um, to access objects in environments. We'll use ggplot2 because there's a couple examples that look at using function factories within ggplot2. And then the scales package, which has some like formatting functions that are function factories. So. Um, so let's kind of dive in here to talk about how does a function factory work. Uh, so starting off, kind of the key point, like I mentioned before, is the enclosing environment of the manufactured function is the execution environment of the function factory. Now, it took me a couple of read throughs to really kind of understand this, but I think I, I think I kind of captured a little bit more, but like I said, I'm going to have to ask the group to kind of explain this a little bit more to me. But really, we start off with this kind of very simplified example where we're creating this function factory called power one, to which has like this nested function inside of it that has uh, an X variable and an exponent variable. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to create a manufactured function called square and cube. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to define this um, exponent value here in the function factory to which gets carried over into the manufactured function square. So to kind of keep things straight here, we got to remember power one is the function factory, square and cube are the manufactured functions. Now, what we can do is, is that we have um, expression pretty much defined in the, uh, I think it's, and this is where I get kind of confused a little bit, is since we have exponent already defined within square and cube, we can pass in the X value in here and then get that operation or get that operation returned. So if we take square of three, we'll get nine. And if we take the cube of three, we'll get 27, okay? What gets really interesting about this is kind of like the interplay with environments and how environments work with this. Because if we just look at the function definition of square and cube, we get the same kind of function definition here. Again, X carried to some exponent. So it's pretty obvious where the X value is coming from. What isn't as an obvious is where is exponent coming from? And so we have to kind of use a little bit of like visual diagrams to kind of explain where those values are binded or where they come from. And those are coming from the previous execution environment of the function factory. So I think I'm saying that right, but somebody correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> That's what I got out of it. Sounds good. Okay, cool. All right, cool. That's what I was making sure. Because like when you when you look at this like diagram and this this diagram again is just taken strictly from the book. Um, at first, like it took it takes a little bit to digest this diagram, but basically what you have here is once you kind of like dig into it, you really start to kind of appreciate these diagrams because it really shows you that interplay of environments and how those interact with your function factory versus your manufactured functions. And so here's your function factory power one, which has its own definition. And here are your manufactured functions, which would be square and cube. And the exponent inside of these manufactured functions is coming from a binding with the previous execution environment to which comes from the function factory. Now, I guess the other thing that I want to make sure is, is like this, this piece of the diagram, does this show that this environment is apparent to this environment or this functions environment? That's the only thing that I really didn't understand is where these blue aspects of the diagram came in. But I don't know if anybody wants to take that. Man, these diagrams, like I'm, I'm, I'm not doing well with them in general. So, but yeah, it's kind of, I was wondering the same thing, right? Because yeah, I don't know, I guess. So the EXP is the parent, but then. It's really uh, the other way around. So it's oh. showing that the parent environment for that environment is the environment of the function factory, right? The function factory has its own environment as well. So I guess this is the way I understand it. And somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Like there. this, is this box the execution environment? Like, okay, like power one gets run. You know, you're defining like cube or square. Does that mean it's creating this execution environment here to which creates this binding? No. And the, the manufactured functions are using those. Is that right? Or am I? Uh, right. When you define power one, the execution environment is one of those boxes well i guess it's not power one. you define when you define cube using power one right during the call to power one there's an execution environment which is one of those boxes up there right it's created uh, yeah you're right so the blue bot that blue link is just showing that was an execution environment for power one when it was running but then because power one returns a function its environment is now it's now that same environment is now saved. Normally those things get tossed away, but now it's saved because it's now attached to the uh, created factory generated freshly minted cube function. So yeah, it was an execution environment. That was, it's no longer the execution environment. It's still hanging around as the function environment now for cube, the closure, part of that closure. Okay, so that makes normally sense. The, so if you look at the 
power one function, its execution, I mean, its, its environment, its closure environment, I, what's the right word for it? Function environment? Function environment is just a global environment, right? See a little black dot. Oh, wait, wait, does this work? See, that's what's confusing me is because sometimes this, like had you see that uses... right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 I can. That green, that dot says that's what's the function of, I'm not sure we use the right terminology, but that's a function environment, so it points to the global environment. For this one, its function environment doesn't point to the global environment, instead points to, boop, that little um, environment that it used to be an execution environment, now is the closure or part of the closure of cube. And I, I suppose uh, not shown is that this environment also has a parent, which I don't, that must be the global environment, it can't be anything. Well, it would be the closure, it would be whatever, because express no, it would be the uh, global environment. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Because that, because I like, because that I think I can clear it. I think because what was kind of confusing to me was like because I think Hadley and I don't want to do too much criticism of it, but like I don't think he does a really good job of defining like here's the execution environment versus the you know, this environment and this environment, like he shows us some of it, but like, it's just hard to keep in my mind, like, which environment are you pulling from? Which environment are you referring to? And yeah, this idea of, that like, go ahead. I was going to say part of this is a terminate terminology issue. If you're not used to using those terms and there, some of these he invented, I think just for this, I mean, certainly the closure environment or the parent environment all makes sense. And, but I'm not sure what he called an execution environment. I guess that makes sense too, but Sometimes that's called the call stack. Oh, he calls it the call stack too. Okay, whatever. Anyway, yeah. And it, and it's this idea that that like execution environment is ephemeral. Like when we first learned that, like it's there, but then it disappears. But now that you're creating a function factory, you're like maintaining that environment, and so it yeah. just gets like yeah, the function it's like environment. Knowledge. He call. I let's look back in chapter seven. The function environment is what he calls that environment that is part of the closure. That is the function. They would have any local variables and things like that defined. Okay, so then is the function environment different than the enclosing environment? Is that different? That's where I got confused and I didn't really know like the difference between the two. I don't think is so. Is the enclosing I mean, environment different than the execution no, the, environment? The, no, no, the execution environment is different than the enclosing environment. But so then, are we saying that the execution <laughs> environment is like where this is defined? No. And then the execution environment is like when it's run. I mean, the enclosing environment, yeah. So the enclosing environment is that thing right there, zero, seven, x, whatever. That's the function environment or enclosing environment, whatever you want to call it. But I like to call it function environment because that's what he calls it. Oh, uh, function environment. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's like where I struggled a little bit was like I knew environments were important to this concept, but I just didn't know like the terminology. I just. I just need that kind of struggle with a little bit. But. Yeah, me too. Cool. Um, any other comments on this? Like, I know this like diagram at first, like when you first look at it, it's just like, oh my gosh, this is a lot. But once you kind of like start picking it apart, it like really helps you kind of better understand like how these components like interact with each other. Um, okay, so we also have to kind of pull on some stuff that we already know. And I did forget to mention at the start of this that, um, I adapted my notes with the previous cohorts notes. So some of the stuff I'm working with from the previous cohort. Um, so if something doesn't make sense, we'll just kind of have to pick through it. But um, some of the stuff that we kind of already mentioned before is this idea of first class functions. Again, the idea that functions act like any other object. We don't have to do anything special to define them. Um, and functions have their own environment and then they have a parent environment to them. If we wanted to look at that, we could use Arlang's FN environment. So if we define this function here, uh, well, here we're creating a binding of Y to one, but then we're creating like an F binding to this function here. And then we're defining what the function environment is. Its environment is the global environment. But then we also have this idea of what we've been talking about, that execution environment. So, you know, execution environments are ephemeral, right? Once they run, the garbage collector will take care of it and just get rid of it. But with function factories, we're going to leverage that execution environment for our function factories. Going back to the idea of like if we define exponent in the execution environment, later manufactured functions when they're run will pull on 
that previous execution environment or the values in that previous execution environment. So some more fundamentals regarding this. Um, there's four things that were kind of brought up when we talk about some of these fundamentals. The first thing is that idea about environments, which I think we've kind of talked about quite a bit already. Um, but there's some, uh, some stuff with lazy evaluation that we need to be careful with. Um, so we sometimes have to do like force calculation. Um, some super assignment. So we have the ability using function factories to maintain state with the use of function factories. Uh, and then there's this concept of like cleaning up. So sometimes if we're like creating an object within our function factories that are quite large, we might want to remove them. And then, uh, so let's kind of explore a little bit about this idea about environments. So to kind of explore this, we're going to go rely on Arlang's environmental print. Um, what's really nice about this function is it's going to give us two pieces of information. It's going to give us the parent environment, but it's also going to give us some information about any bindings that are in that enclosing environment. So using that example that we were before, using that manufactured function called square, what we can do is using environmental print, we can get the parent environment, which is the global, and then we can get all, this, all the specific bindings that are in that execute or that enclosing environment. So in our case, we had expression, which is of type double. And so for us to kind of know exactly what that, um, that binding is in that execute in that enclosing environment, we can run this function environment, but then use the dollar sign notation to pull it out. So here, if we take the manufactured function square, pull out the, um, the binding of exponent, we can see it's two, right? So um, this was the, the same diagram that we have before, just transformed and kind of simplified, where Hadley was basically like, um, he said like any of these free floating stuff, is in the global environment. So, um, which is kind of interesting because now that I think about it, this is this two in the global environment, but then what we do is we just have this binding to this value in the global environment. If that's what he's saying, I think. No, two, it's in, a, it's in that execution environment, which has now become the function environment. You, if you look at it, the same environment, is, there's an environment that's created when you execute the um, function generator, right? Yep. And that environment is literally OX7F8, that's where the pointer to it is. That same pointer is now just copied into the function environment of Square now, and then it's not, it's not garbage collected anymore because it's got a link, so it's not gonna get garbage collected. So you've captured oh. it. You've captured the execution environment and made it into a function environment. That's maybe a better way to say it. I don't know. I may be, I have a head code. I, I may be making no sense at all. <laughs> but that's basically what well, I'm happens. Just well, I'm just wondering now because like because now that I'm thinking about what he said about this diagram, I think if I remember the terminology, he's just like, okay, any of these free floating values are now mm -hmm. are well, free floating variables, free floating variables. variables. But the but the box two is just a it's just a value. I mean, I guess I mean it's just a constant, right? So it's not anywhere. It's so then this value, so this value, could you attach another thing to it? No, it's just a value two. Like, it's like the number two, literally is the number two, right? No, oh, okay. I guess it was something okay. complicated, like a data frame though. Yeah, it would be a pointer to the same data frame because we might only do modify and copy, right? So it would be a link, a pointer to if that's something that also existed in a global environment in that case. But two is not really, doesn't take any memory, right? It's just, I mean, it does, but it's not like a, it's not only one two in the world. There's Every time you need a two, you make a new one. <laughs> Does that make any sense? I wouldn't test yeah, no. the significance of the fact that that two is floating around free. It doesn't mean necessarily that it doesn't follow his rule, I don't think, about being in the global environment. Yeah, so I think what's really, I think if, if, if I'm understanding this correctly, what's really important is this binding. Like it's this binding that's, that's really important because right like this too wouldn't exist. The garbage collector would just get rid of it, right? The garbage collector would get rid of it, but because we turned it into a manufactured function, it's like, hey, create this binding in this execution environment of this manufactured function. So the next time that you call this manufactured function, this too gets evaluated. Am I right? 
Yeah, essentially. I mean, you said execution. I think you meant to say function environment, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, function environment. Yep. Uh, okay, okay. Environments. We, we, I thought we said in the chapter it wasn't that important, but... <laughs> it's <laughs> really like, yeah, not, though. I, mean, we're, I think you're, in some ways, I think maybe we're overthinking a little bit. I mean, it's just like, it's not that, the way you generally use these is not that big a deal. You just recognize, it, oh, I'm creating a little closure here. It's own little special environment where I can define things and they hang around like an object almost. Hmm. Next point. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think it's maybe um, how R6 objects are even made, sort of, but. Well, that's that's where I think we're kind of getting into that realm of like, and I think we kind of talk about it here when we start talking about some of the examples, but like where it's like if you're trying to maintain state, because function factories can technically maintain state. It's like if you're getting into that realm of maintaining a lot of different, a lot of different states of different variables, you should be using OOP and you should be relying on S3, S4, R6, right? I think. Yeah, I yeah, I think so. I mean, the only these function factors are specifically useful for cases where you need to have a function for something else and needs it, like in the examples it gives in this chapter. Mm -hmm. So like for a map uh, or something, move, right? Oh yeah, for like a functional. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Um, kind of moving on from there, there was this there was this discussion about this little bit of a bug and this use of force. And this was kind of interesting if you had the opportunity to look at the um, the exercises. Uh, there was a little exercise about like force and what force does. And if you dig into it, it's like, hey, uh, force really doesn't do anything. It's just some, what they call some tactical sugar, right? It's it's a function that's basically meant to uh, make it more intentional what you're trying to do. And you're trying to force the execution of a variable so you don't have any issues with like lazy evaluation. So I, I don't know why I can't get it to replicate here. Um, I tried to see what was wrong with it in my notes, but basically here's the same definition of power one. And what we do is we define square, uh, the square function. I think I might know what's wrong with this now, but we're gonna do some indirection here where we first bind X to this value two and run square and we get four. But the book shares this example that if we do some indirection where we create this binding of X to three and run square two, it should return eight. Um, I don't know why my notes are not producing eight, but the reason why this is the case is because of lazy evaluation, because X, and somebody correct me if I'm not saying this right, X doesn't get evaluated until square is evaluated, right? And so, um, because like, remember, it goes back to the idea of like function arguments, like function arguments are lazy. They're not going to be evaluated unless they're needed. And so like if you define it up here first with X, X is not going to run until you run the actual square function. And then it's going to define that binding or use that binding. Um, so how do we fix this little bug? We use this function called force. We do force expression. Here's the function definition. If we do that kind of same thing, it should produce the output as expected. Um, it took me a little bit to kind of wrap my mind around here, around this, but it just goes back to that foundational concept of lazy evaluation and why that's the case. So, hey, um, you mentioned somewhere in the book or somewhere like I'm saying something like, oh, um, you know, force doesn't really do anything, but if it's overcoming like some kind of assumption of the language, that seems like it's doing a lot to me. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Maybe you were just being facetious, but and I have read something like that before too about some some types of syntactical sugar or whatever you want to call it functions aren't that useful. I mean, I guess utility is in the eye of the beholder. It seems wildly useful to me, but alas, I wonder if that's something they changed in R. So that that's why you're not seeing that do that. Maybe they've changed it so that in certain cases it'll automatically force. I don't know. Yeah, I'm getting four as well. I yeah, see and I know we... to, to, to that. Yeah, I think we've seen a couple of those times where like something has changed where it could be that 
that is the common behavior now. And I think Stone, you said you just replicated it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's odd. Um, maybe it's not a thing anymore. But I think going back to like, you know, the point that was being made about force, it's like, if you look at the definition of it, it's like, you can just put EXP here, like EXP and not put force over it. And it will do the same thing, or it should, unless that behavior has been modified. Um, but I think like Hadley's, like the documentation's argument of using this is like, you are being explicit in what you're doing. So when people read it, they know that you're forcing execution of, of expression. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the use of return, right? In a function, like you don't always have to use that return. Like you could just mm -hmm. leave it as is, right? So. But being explicit is a is a very good reason to use anything, let alone force. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because if you just had free floating exp here, people would be like, "What's going on here?" But now that you have a function wrapped around it, you know, you look at it and you go, "Oh, they're doing something to this. It's not just some free floating value or some free floating variable in your function." Right. Um, so the next kind of conversation was this idea of like creating, using function factories, create uh, stateful functions. And so this is another use of the, the super assignment operator. So obviously we're pretty familiar with the usual assignment operator, right? This always creates a binding in the current environment, but if you use the super assignment operator, it's gonna rebind an, exa an existing name in a parent environment. And so what we can do is we can leverage the use of this to create a, um, a function that can maintain state. And so an example that Hadley provides in the book is this idea of the counter function. And so what we do is we're defining this um, function factory here where we're just um, binding I to zero. And then what we do is we have a function here that uses the uh, super assignment so that every time that this function runs, I gets pushed up into the next level of this function and it increments I. So what's nice about this is we can, if we can create this binding of counter one and counter two. And because of, uh, I can't remember the concept now, but I think it's because of the fresh start concept. Anytime that we run like counter one versus counter two, it will maintain, maintain states separately from each other. So if we run counter one here, it's one. If we run counter one again, it's two. And then if we run counter two, it's gonna be one because these functions are completely independent of each other. Even though that the definition is the same, they're completely separated from each other. I think due to the fresh start principle, but somebody correct me if I'm, I feel like I'm not saying that correctly. Yeah, it's... Um... I found this on the web. Well, maybe Siri's got the answer. Uh, the, the, I think what he's referring to is up there a new counter. The very first line says I goes to I equals zero. That's a single oh. arrow assignment. So you remember how R works when you do a single arrow assignment. If it doesn't exist in the current environment, which right now is an execution environment at that point, it'll create a new variable, fresh start, called I. Mm -hmm. Right. Then that that is now been defined in that execution environment. Now when you the next line creates a new returns a function, right? Creates a function, returns it. It'll use that I from that execution environment, which is now again the function environment when it returns it. So it captures that I inside the execution environment huh. to become the function environment. So oh, the, the, hold on. Sense. Actually, now now you guys made a mistake getting me into this now. Like I'm <laughs> He made the worst mistake of the night, Ron. Sorry. Um, uh -oh. Okay. So the the original the night's yeah, young. I, what's that? Yeah, I know. Seriously. Um, so the I um, uh, assignment zero. Okay. So that's that's just the functional environment, the execution environment, whatever you want to call it. But then the function. <sighs> okay. So then the 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 next I assignment is the super assignment below. So you're taking the value. So, th th so I mean, aren't we aren't we like assigning i twice? Then remember that stuff that's inside the function 
the lower function doesn't happen when you call new counter, right? It only happens when you then call whatever you got back from new counter, like counter one or counter two. Well, that just gets, that just creates a function, doesn't execute it. Yeah. So that's... by the time you actually do call it, I has a value now in that local uh, environment, in that function environment of zero. And then we use super assignment here because we don't want to create a new I, another fresh start, which is what would happen if we only use a single assignment. We want to make sure we use a double error to assign to the enclosing yeah. environment I, which is that function environment. This is like inception. There's like dreams. Uh, it is a little bit. It is a dreams. little bit. Yeah. yeah. One no, of the exercises I, yeah. has you walk through uh, uh, changes yeah. to this thing that will help, I think, illuminate how it works. Because like if you don't use the if you don't use the closure or if you don't use the double uh, the global assignment super assignment, then what happens? So that's worth doing just to get a little intuition. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the exercise is like, hey, don't use the super assignment. And then I don't know. I don't want to be a spoiler alert, but it basically just like if you run that function over and over again, it's just going to keep outputting one. Yeah, that's all that, it's going to do. In that case, it's going to every time you run the function, it's going to fresh start again every time make in its execution environment and ignore the enclosing but, environment. Can I just ask this? But the super assignment that means it's going to the parent environment. I mean, which in this yes. case is it's it's not. Is it the new counter environment? Is what we're saying? Yes. Oh. Well, it's the new counter and execution by which is then captured. Mm -hmm. Right. Because okay. it's like, because there's like three, like there's three environments here. You have this environment here enclosed by this function. And then you have another environment, which is captured by this function. And then the third environment would be the global environment, right? Yeah, I guess that's my one of my things is I guess I'm, I'm assuming that the super assignment is going to the global environment, which is not correct, but it's it's just one level. Normally up, really. it would, but now there it, now because it's it's this yeah. it's this anonymous function that's yeah being created inside of new counter. Okay, so it's it's environment isn't the global environment anymore. Now it's the execution environment for new counter during that particular execution. And next time new counter is called, another brand new fresh execution environment is created, and that's going to get inside the next counter. So they're separated that way. My brain hurts. <laughs> it, it, it does require a little bit of a. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's cool. It is the way cool. to really learn this is to, yeah. is to implement your own programming language. Then you'll totally understand. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean it's like it's it is just... cool. You, I, I grasp it for a minute, and then it kind of it kind of sidesteps me, and then it's like, well, I'm I'm back. But no, it, it is cool when you grasp it. Yeah. I think it's just interesting going back into like, if you take these foundational concepts, you can get to an even more like abstract concept of this idea of maintaining state, right? You can create this function factory that now can maintain the state of like a specific variable that you have. So I think this is like an important concept because I know we're probably gonna get into this when we start talking about OOP because, you know, OOP, we're going to be managing the state of many different variables in, I'm guessing, some other type of execution environment handled by like an S3 object, an R6 object, S4 object, I'm assuming, but so this concept will probably come up again for sure. Mm -hmm. And so here it comes back here, like as soon as your function starts managing the state of multiple variables, it's better to switch to R6. So that's basically where it's coming from. Um, kind of moving on, there's this concept of like garbage collection or this idea of managing large objects. So if you have a function that creates something inside of the execution environment that is of significant size, it's best just to remove it. Um, so using RM to do that. So here's an example where we define this function where we're creating Basically, the output of this function is just to create the mean, to, to calculate the mean of some uh, uniform distribution. And so all we really care about is this M value getting returned or the value of M returned. And so it's not useful to maintain this uniform distribution that we define. So if we create this very large uniform distribution of values, um, if we keep that, what we'll have is we'll have this like object that's the size of like eight mags 
so, but since we don't really care about that, we only care about the one value that gets outputted, it's best just to remove it, you know, remove the uniform distribution here, and it comes back at, you know, 13.3 kilobytes, right? So it's just really this concept of like, you know, cleaning up after yourself. Like there's no need, like after you create your calculation, there's really no need to maintain it within your, your manufactured function. So just get rid of it. So, um, any other questions about this or did you test that? Else? I didn't actually have a chance to test that. Did you test that? Is this Not, I did, I did the example. I did the example, but I think it's just, I think it's, it, it did return like, the, like, <laughs> okay. It, that is a shocking something like that. Yeah. I, 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 I've done. Yeah. That's, that's an authorization that the R guy should consider because you could check the function body to see if it actually refers to that, any variables in the environment, then get rid of them. But maybe that's a hard problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But. I don't know. I think it's just coming back to the idea of just like thinking about like what your what your manufactured functions are containing, and if you need that much, you know, an object of that size to maintain. Because again, the the purpose of this function is just to return one value, which is the calculation of the mean. Right. And so. I mean, you could maintain this, right? Like you could return both of these in a list. Your function what I'm could saying, return out. Yeah. What I'm saying oh, is since the function doesn't, I wonder if there's a syntactical analysis the R interpreter could do is say, oh, wait a minute, we don't never need that. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll garbage collect that for you. And then you don't have to remember to do that, you know? Hmm. Sort of like with the force thing, right? I wonder if there's optimization they could do. That's why I was wondering if you tried it and yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, I think it comes back to like, if you wanted to, you could return both of these, like if you had like a purpose to have both of these values, you know, just return a list, list yeah, you could, but, dash yeah. X. But if you, don't, if you, you want clearly that, don't, if you clearly don't, then it seems bad to me that you have to remember to RM just automatically X. remove it. Yeah. It's about, I thought, remember the, I, thought, I feel like tonight's mantra is being explicit. So RM, X is, oh, okay. is, is explicit. Sorry, I just I just feel like I need to be devil's advocate. I don't actually. No, know that's, that's a really good point. Yeah, that, I mean that's a good point, right? Like if you if you dig into this the source of this and you see like oh they're they're calculating like you know a uniform distribution but you know it disappears or like it's still there. You know, yeah, I think that's I think that's. Maybe it's I would write it as run if then pipe into mean, and then I would have to ever have the X variable at all. <laughs> oh, I wonder if you could do that. Yeah, if you could pipe this into mean, and if that it wouldn't because you're not you're not defining a variable in the execution environment, so it's right. gone. Hmm, that's interesting. That's a good point. Looks nicer anyway. Hmm. <laughs> I think one thing you could also do is like, even if it's not defined, if for some reason you, you could access the environment of the function and look into it to see if it X is there or not. So um, mm. like yeah. you might have weird metaprogramming stuff around that where it's just like, okay, I want to see what's inside the enclosing environment, even if it's not being used or like how it was created essentially, something like that. So. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, this is a very simple, you know, you're just doing a very simple kind of operation here. And like, but say you had like a really complex one and you want to dump like a browser in here to like look at it as the function was running. And you know that X is here, it would give you the opportunity to double check X before anything else. So I, I like that idea too. Wouldn't we also yeah. just save the same amount of space if we just put the run if statement just inside the mean? function i mean like then we're like not having to like save any objects before m right or i don't know i don't know if that makes a difference but yeah that's what i was suggesting i was gonna oh did you pipe. already suggest that I'm, I'm well i was gonna do with the pipe but it's the same thing it's just in oh yeah it's true yeah hmm yeah, yeah i think i mean there's oh go ahead just, i was just gonna say if you copy and paste the run if n and just put it where the x that you have, have highlighted and then yeah. Hmm. Multiple ways. I think he's. I think he's just talking about like, hey, if you don't need this just massive object, mm -hmm. get rid of it. And here's how you do it. But if you need it, you know, keep it. You know. So. Hmm. Um. Okay. So we're gonna kind of move into some like specific examples, 
And I have to be kind of upfront, like I understood the graphical factories examples, but when we get to like the statistical ones, like those ones are really challenging because I don't have the mathematical or statistical chops to fully explain what's going on with those. So if we get there tonight, I might need some help with those. But um, what's really nice about the graphical factories is this comes from like ggplot2. Uh, ggplot2 has a few functions that are technically function factories and they create a really in, really nice useful um, interface with ggplot2 code and so some of the examples that are available are these functions called comma format which basically we just have this vector y here with some values that aren't formatted but obviously we could comma format them and that's where this kind of function factory comes in is we can you know, create a comma kind of formatting, turn it into a character vector with comma formatting. But you can also use some other functions that allow you to pass arguments into the function to make it, to simplify it. So here's a big number, we can, you know, simplify it and then suffix it with like the letter K to show for thousands. And it just makes it into a character vector like this. Now, the utility of it isn't really apparent here, but it really becomes really useful when you look at it in the context of ggplot2 code. So we have this ggplot here and say we want to define the formatting for our different, um, for the scale, the y, kind of the y scale here. We can pot, pass comma format in and get commas in here. But the other thing that's really nice is say we want to do the number formatting all we have to do is pass this function here and then pass additional um, additional arguments into it to which then gets passed into this function and then formats it for us. So kind of a really neat way to kind of see how a function factory creates a really nice user interface for ggplot2 code, um, especially with like number formatting. The other example that it shares with this is this idea of bind widths. So um, especially within like faceted histograms. So I didn't know this, um, but I thought this was kind of interesting that you can in, I think it's what geom histogram or no, geom hist or something. The function to create a histogram within ggplot2, you can define a function for bin width bins. And what you can do is you can define a function factory to define your own bins. Yep. Going a little bit, going a little bit further is like you can uh, expand it into using like a switch statement to use some of these other functions that are like predefined that are optimized to figure out the correct bandwidth. So, but um, Ryan, you're gonna say something? Oh no, I uh, yeah, I, I I at one point I did get into to that functionality of the bin with thing uh, years ago but yeah that's a cool deal sorry that was all yeah and i mean what you can do is you can define your own function factory to do that right like you can create your own function factory which allows you to do that and if you wanted to go further you could use some of these like other like functions that are defined to optimize that bin with um, definition so uh, anything else that anybody had about this like application of function factories for like graphical factories? I thought this was kind of neat, just this idea right here about the idea of like how it creates a really neat interface. So yeah, those I, I know a lot of people that do stuff like that where they do these little, I guess. I, I, I like I guess I always thought of them as like window functions or whatever, like you know, or things that you kind of add to the you know other functionality to make it cooler. But yeah, I have I've seen this and I've always wanted to get into it, but too intimidated so far. Well, now you know that they're just function factories. <laughs> right, right, right. They're, and they're flexible enough for you to create your own function factor, your own manufactured function, which can do this. So kind of neat to kind of know that. Um, we can look at some of these non-obvious combinations. Um, if anybody wants to dive into these deeper, I'm just going to be 100% honest. I don't have the statistical or mathematical chops to really dive into these. So I just to do it justice, I'm going to open it up to the group. If anybody wants to like dive into like any of these individual ones to discuss them, um, or you know if anybody wants to take 
them from me because yeah, I understand the concepts of a box Cox transformation. I understand the concepts of bootstrap. Uh, I have a, you know, I've used maximum likelihood estimation, but like digging into how they're calculated is just beyond my skill level. So I'm just going to open it up to the group if anybody wants to dig into these. Hmm. Um, um, at least, can you scroll down to the, um, sorry, so it's a uh, box guy. Oh, it's bootstrap. Can you, yeah, can you go down to, I want to see what kind of bootstrap they're doing here. Have you done much bootstrap kind of stuff, Ron? Yeah, I, I, I love doing, I love bootstrap. It's a great technique. And basically all he's doing is taking advantage of function factory so that he can calculate the bootstraps more easily, right? Right. Capturing all the, you know, the particulars about, you know, in this case, it's a, where is the one that he's doing? This is just one example that I pulled. I mean, I can get the advanced. Right. Well, the one that down below, the one with the linear model, that's the kind of thing that's very helpful because often like you have to, if you're doing like the residual bootstrapping, then yeah, it's very useful to be able to, um, you know, capture all that. I got to take my data frame, which is not changing, but I'm going to, you know, fit it. I'm going to calculate the residuals. And I'm going to sample the residuals, right? So the fitting and everything else is I do one time and it's the, you know, sampling the residuals I do. It's the resampling. Time. Yeah. yeah. So I capture I, that's a nice separation of concerns where we get some of the work done in the outer part and then return the sampler as it was a function, right? I've got this bootstrapper now that I can just call over and over and over again to get new bootstraps. It just, it's, you know, yeah, it's just convenient, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm not sure how, I mean, I've done that exact thing with the function factory before because um, I can't think of any other way to do it that doesn't require <laughs> Refitting, yeah. you know, I guess you could do it in the global environment, but if you're going to be doing lots of different um, formulas, trying different things, it, you don't want to have yeah. those things all sitting around the global environment. Yeah, sometimes I'll like store a lot of the stuff in a list and just have like the list have like be an object essentially, and then you can just pass the list around. But this is sort of cleaner in the fact that you don't have a list in your global environment. It just stored mm. inside the function um yeah that's interesting i've always wanted to work with lists more but that's a good idea too i mean that's probably more uh, yeah there's probably so a lot of reasons like, for doing it that way because then you have you might want those you know particular fitted results back to you have to re, then you have to refit it again this way because i just threw away the uh yeah well you could I think you could maybe get it out again. So like, for example, like I was saying before, you could access the environment of the function and have it force it to look into it. But um, yeah, that's a good point um, in terms of like the way I would try to think about doing this would I make like a list that had mod fitted and residual in it. And then I would have like another function that would just take the list and then it would just access those elements as needed. Um, so yeah, but yeah, there's pl plenty of ways to do it. Yeah. I, I like the idea of like keeping it clean, right? Mm -hmm. Like it keeps your environment clean. So, you know, if you know, you don't wanna clutter up your environment with a bunch of other objects that you don't necessarily need. And if you're going to just be calling this manufactured function over and over again just to get your values from your yeah. bootstrap i mean that makes sense right yeah yeah um also if you're fitting like a bunch of different models you don't want like if you're trying like uh, 10 different models you don't have like 10 different lists flowing around or 10 different models in your environment in general you get messy very fast yeah so it's like leveraging environments to help keep things clean basically right like or leveraging these concepts in functional factory which relies on environments to keep things clean so it's neat okay that's cool yeah i get that um yeah when it got to maximum likelihood like I, I i'm more of an applied person when it comes to this stuff so like when it when it got into like the theoretical parts of it i was like eh, <laughs> this was beyond, yeah, for, beyond for real i, it's I just... know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets it's, 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 it gets difficult, man. Yeah, so 
uh, I mean, if anybody wants to talk about this more, I'd, I'd be happy to, but like, I just don't have the, I don't have the skill to fully get, do it, do it due diligence. So <laughs> um, I guess the last thing that we can talk about here to kind of round this up and to kind of round out the rest of the chapter in the next four minutes that we have together is this idea of uh, function factory applications, specifically trying to combine function factories with functionals. So this is kind of like a really neat trick, kind of combining what we learned about in chapter nine with what we learned about here is we can define a list of different like function names with different mm -hmm. arguments. So obviously square, cube, root, cube root, reciprocal. What we can do is we can basically use per map to create a bunch of manufactured functions using our power one function factory. And then we could just basically call whatever we want using dollar sign notation to do like root of 64, which would be eight. Um, same definition from power one, we're just leveraging the use of those different execution environments with these different binded values. So square, cube, root, cube root, so on and so forth. Um, the book talks about that there's ways if you don't want to use dollar sign notation to do this, you can use a function called with and then do like root, whatever you want to take the root of. Um, and then the one that I really didn't understand was this idea of a tab. <gasps> oh yeah, yeah. That's an old school thing. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I, cause I mean, I'm coming fresh off of like the, our packages book and it's like, Hey, don't ever do this. But then it's like, in this exactly. book, it's like, yeah. Hey, you can do this. And so it's like, here's what, here's what it used to be like. Okay. So back in the day. So like when I first started like kind of butzing with R, like in like 2011 or 12, um, that's how people worked is instead of like assigning an, you know, data to an object in, in memory in global memory or whatever, you would attach the data to your global environment, which sounds insane now to say it out loud, but that was like what you did, right? Um, instead of loading it as an object, I don't, and I can't even remember why that was something that you did. And by the way, if you look at like old, te like our textbooks from like 10 years ago, they'll be like, first attach the data, you know, to, or attach this function or whatever. If you wrote a function, I don't, yeah, it's 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 super dangerous. Yeah, maybe it's because before tidyverse, right? You often would have to write write d you know df dollar sign x df dollar sign yep. y, right? That would get tedious yeah. real quick. Yeah, I actually like dollar sign notation because to me, I like the sort of a hierarchical nature of it. Like you have, you know, where, where's whatever the thing that you're pointing to coming from, and but. Maybe, yes, yeah, not for everybody, I guess. But yeah, never attach. Jeez. Well, because like attach, because I think it goes back to that concept of like all of your like libraries, right? Like your libraries have their own environments in yep. it. And remember, like if we go back to that like example, I can pull up the chapter, but like chapter seven, it had like those chain. It started with like the empty environment, global environment, then all the package environments. Oh, right. Yeah. So I wonder if, so I wonder if like, you know, hey don't do the attach because that's an issue it can start messing with your package environment which it does right the following <clears> objects <throat> if you do it this way it's it's it, they're being masked because you now attach to your own definition in the global environment here which is a bunch of your manufactured functions yeah but, all the more reason to use you, the conflicted package like i said like three or four meetings ago that's like my that 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 thing saved my life well, now you know how to now you know how to create your own your own manufactured right. functions from using functionals, and and now you know how to attach it, so you don't have to use those prefixes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I actually had a need for this at some point. I don't remember why exactly. I can't remember exactly, but basically, I wanted to like programmatically create variables. So like, I had like a bunch of variable names, and I needed like. It is like every combination of name one, name two, name three. So it was like 50 variables. And I was like, oh, how do I actually get this into my environment um, out of my function? And I didn't really have a way to do that. So I ended up returning a list and then accessing the list repeatedly. But for some reason, for like some parallelization reason, I needed to actually be in the environment. So I had no idea how to do it. So I came up with some other solution. But in this case, you could imagine like, 
programmatically creating like a list of like a thousand some things and then assigning it programmatically and then attaching it to your environment so you get access to all of them but yeah uh, I wonder if like attach is just like just throw it into the global. If it's like a function yeah. that's like just throw it into the global. Yeah, hmm. that makes sense. Hey, if you need it, you need it. I just I just know in our packages it's like don't do this. Yeah. Um, but the last thing to round us up here real quick, there's there's another way to do it. You can use our Lang's environmental bind, which then you just attach to the global environment. Um, but it works the same, and then you unbind this way, but. I wanted to kind of finish that up and we can open it up for some more conversation, but I know I'm already like two minutes over. Um, yeah, so I got I I a dash, you guys. So next week is Ron though, right? And I'm doing the week after, I think. Yeah, I think we got function operators coming up next, which I think is Ron, so. Oh, okay. I will uh, see you guys <laughs> then. Take care. See ya. See you later. I mean, I could hang out here for a little bit and chat a little yeah. bit more through this, but I think huh? that's pretty much function yeah. factories. In a nutshell, I just had one comment. I think there is a difference between attach and uh, our bind because attach will uh, um, attach the object to the search path, right? Whereas our bind will actually put those variables right into your environment. So there is a there is a slight difference. Uh, okay, it's in one of the exercises um, they have to do, but okay, that's good to know. Yeah. yeah, some of the exercises, like I look at them and I'm like, uh, to be honest, know. me too. I just write in my notes <laughs> of saying, uh, I would have skipped this one, just look at the solution. <laughs> I'm have time. Some of them are just like, man, like the one about like the ECDF and then the, like the other one, I That's can't remember what it was like. Yeah. I was just like, I, I started reading the solution. I was like, I'd have to know like what the ECDF function is and how that works. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm not going to look at it. So. Some of them make some of them like the the force was a good one where yeah. it was like, hey, you don't have to do this, but it's good to be explicit and stuff like that. But yeah, function factories. I mean, I think you know, I think they're a really interesting tool. I just you know, it's really kind of just wrapping my mind around the differences in the different environments. And maybe I'm thinking about it too much about like how the environments work, but um you know, they help, they help in certain situations. So. Yeah. I mean, sometimes my view on these things, if it requires that much effort to get it into my brain and it's just going to fall right back out again, maybe I better just not bother. But in this case, uh, <laughs> I already put that stuff in my brain a long time ago, but I, I'm having trouble clearly explaining it to someone else. So it must not be in there that well, <laughs> so, but I'm not going to worry about it because as long as I understand the idea of the closure, I'm, I'm good. I mean, I just like wonder how many people actually like really know about this, right? Like if somebody's going to read my code, if they're going to understand, like if I define a, a function factory, like are people really going to like people who maybe not as deep into it as we are, are going to like, oh, I know what a function factory is. And then you have to go through that whole process of like, this is what a function factory is. This is how it works, you know? So. I mean, my, if you really want to learn more about that type of thing, I can highly recommend the Structure Interpretation Computer Programs book because that is a major topic of the whole thing about the environmental environments and closures and the rest. So, but it does use schemes, so you learn as much. But the scheme is so scheme is like a non-language. It's almost just like functions, and that's it. So. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. Like, I mean, basically like you're leveraging the use of environments, right? Yeah. And I like that idea because it's come up, like I had that conversation in the Slack um, because I came across, I think I shared it in the Slack, especially within like package development. Like there's ways to store variables in that environment so you don't have to clutter up the global environment. And so, you know, I understand the utility of them and how helpful they can be to keep things organized. It's just a really abstract concept coming at it from like, I'm just doing an interactive analysis now to like, where do I put things? How are things stored? And how does that influence like the functions you're using and like stuff like that? It just gets really like abstract really quick. But I agree. I, I really, I think these diagrams, I think these diagrams, although they're like at first when you look at them, you're like, oh, this is a lot. If you like pick them apart, I think they really, they really do help like create a mental image of what's like going on in the background. 
but ever since you have all these arrows and dots <laughs> it's kind of like uh <laughs> yeah. but yeah go ahead oh no i didn't oh. and i think like and i think these things are going to come up again like especially when we start talking about like quasi quotation and stuff like that these are just going to become even more like in depth so hey one other thing stone uh you have been part of book clubs before you know sorry have you been a member of other book clubs i haven't this is the first one so i mean do you uh do you know how these things work like you can you know where the sign up sheet is and all that kind of stuff yeah Colin. i generally <laughs> but... um, yeah everything's in the slack channel but yeah these, that's a good point ron like everything's in the slack channel john Harmon, or referred to as john the geek um he manages like all the background of all this stuff but like if you open up the slack channel yeah on the ribbon on the top there's like everything that you need and so like if you want to volunteer to present we have a i can share my screen again so you can see it we have like a sign up sheet so if you're interested like we encourage you know anybody to to take on a topic because the best way to learn a topic is to present on it um yeah and you're not required to like, you know, we want, you know, we want everyone to be comfortable, but if you have like a specific topic that's coming up that you're interested in, definitely sign up. Yeah, I can definitely sign up for something. So no problem. yeah. And I, and I usually reach out. I try to like a few days before to double check to make sure everything's going well. Cool. Um, and this group's pretty good. I've been pretty happy so far with like people jumping in and everybody's been pretty open about like taking on topics so that's been very helpful <laughs> yeah for sure yeah i can definitely take a topic um or so and then we do yeah. have oh go ahead ron my only reason for bringing that up is i just want to make sure that we didn't talk about it before so i just want to make sure the stone knew how to how to do all those things <laughs> no that's a good point like i always kind of forget about it because i've done i've done a bunch of these now and i kind of <laughs> overlook some of it so I really appreciate you jumping in about that. Um, cool. I don't know unless anybody else has anything else. I think I'm that's gonna pretty much all I have. I think so. I'm gonna go lay down and uh, take a nap. <laughs> Said goes killing right, me. Cool. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, yeah. well, hope you feel better, Stone. Yeah. It was nice to meet you. Thanks, so, you guys, we'll see everybody too. next week. Yep. See you yep. next week. See you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.